tend to be where the light and darkness meet on the edge of the horizon through the trees i am a narcissist crippled with self-doubt i've got a courage that brings me to my knees hello hi and howdy how's everybody doing today I certainly hope everyone's doing well. If you're new here, my name is Jenny. If you are a return visitor, as always, welcome back. If you get anything out of this content, uh, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. Today's story is a suggestion from Crystal Light 429 And Crystal, if you see this, thank you so much for the suggestion. I decided to do this story now, as it actually happened on Halloween. And we're in the Halloween season, so... Let's jump in. This story is going to be very graphic, so I do want to add a content warning um, to this story. It's a lot, but um, let's get started. Doreen Ray Hitchens was born on November 29th in 1952 in Santa Clara, California to parents Franklin Gale and Lucille Catherine Hitchens. She was said to have grown up in a kind and loving family, leading her to have a kind and generous personality, and this led her to a career as a physical therapist. This career was perfect for her as she loved to help others. Per Doreen's daughter, Doreen was an angel. She loved to help others. She would volunteer at schools. She loved to be around kids. Doreen's friends set her up with a man named William Michael Dennis, who went by Mike. Mike had a much different life than Doreen. Mike suffered significant hearing loss as a child. He wore hearing aids, and back then they were very bulky, and they had an attachment that the wearer would keep in their pocket. He also had a problem with stuttering. Because of this, Mike was more of a loner. Uh, according to an interview that Mike's cousin John McDowell gave for an episode of the television show Snapped, Mike also suffered from depression and told a psychiatrist that he had trouble getting a girlfriend. His cousin John further said that, that was, however, until he met Doreen while he was working as a sprayer at Lockheed's. He said that Mike really thought he had found the right one. They had a short relationship, only a few months, under a year, and they got married on the 12th of August in 1972. And then on the 17th of April in 1976, Doreen gave birth to the couple's son, Michael Paul Dennis, who they called Paul. Per Mike's cousin, Mike adored Paul. He was a very doting father. Not long after the birth of Paul, the couple filed for a divorce, however, and in 1977, the divorce was final, and Doreen retained primary custody of Paul, with Mike having visitation on weekends. According to the courts, Mike didn't really want the divorce, and it left him a little bit bitter. Doreen met 28-year-old Charles Herbert, who owned a local carpet store, one day when he stopped to help her with her car as she had a flat tire, they soon began a relationship. He was the polar opposite of Mike and she found him to be a breath of fresh air. On the 5th of June in 1979, Doreen married Charles and moved herself and Paul into his home that he had purchased eight years prior in the neighborhood of Bury Esta, I hope I'm saying that right, which was only six blocks from the home where Mike was living. It was only a six-minute walk, which he would walk it to pick up Paul. On the 26th of November in 1979, Doreen gave birth to her and Charles' daughter, Deanna. Unfortunately, in February of 1980, while Doreen was doing her chores and Deanna was napping, Paul climbed through the fence that surrounded Charles and Doreen's swimming pool. He fell into the water. Doreen went to look for him, but by the time she realized what had happened, it was too late. Paul was transported to the hospital and was put on life support, but on the 13th of February in 1980, Paul passed away with Doreen and Mike at his side. Mike refused to accept what had happened to Paul as being an accident. He believed that Charles and Doreen planned it to get Mike completely out of their lives for good. No matter what Doreen said or what the medical examiner ruled, he just would not believe them. 
Mike filed a lawsuit against Charles and Doreen for the wrongful death of Paul, and in March of 1982, a civil jury returned a verdict in favor of Charles and Doreen as they believed it was nothing more than an accident. A tragic and horrible accident, but an accident. When court was over, Charles and Doreen told Mike that they never wanted to see or hear from him again. Mike became more and more bitter and continued to refuse to believe it was an accident. He told one of his co-workers at Lockheed that he believed Doreen took Paul's life. He said that she had not been watching him and did not dive in to rescue him when she found him at the bottom of the swimming pool. Mike's life and mental health continued to deteriorate over the next few years. Doreen became pregnant twice after losing Paul, but lost both children to miscarriages. But in 1984, the couple learned Doreen was pregnant again and this time all seemed to be going well. She learned she was having a son. Charles and Doreen were both ecstatic. Doreen felt that it could help her fill the void of losing her only son to, by having a boy, and not to replace Paul, but to help fill the void. Charles was excited to have a son as well, and he looked forward to teaching him how to be a man and thought of all the exciting things that they could do. Doreen was due to give birth in early November, so by Halloween in 1984, she was very large and, of course, uncomfortable. Doreen was said to be very small framed, and she was under five foot tall, so her sister joked with her that she was as far out as she was high. Now, remember earlier I said that Mike lived only a six-minute walk from Charles and Doreen, and news traveled fast of Doreen expecting a son, so it took no time that it should have reached Mike. And... People had said that he knew and he was furious, that he felt like Charles had the life that he was supposed to have with his wife, and he didn't even have Paul. However, later, Mike will claim he never knew. In October of 1984, Mike lost his position as the sprayer at Lockheed. He was allowed to take a different position in the document reproduction unit, but the downgrade in the position also meant a downgrade in pay. He went from making thirteen fifty three an hour to only making ten ninety nine an hour. And for reference, in nineteen eighty four, thirteen fifty three would have had the spending power of thirty eight dollars and fifty one cents today, and ten ninety nine an hour would have spending power of twenty nine sixty two today. So a pretty substantial pay cut, but still good wages for nineteen eighty four. Mike acted congenial towards the other workers in his new position, but it was clear he wasn't happy with it by the comments that he made about the unit to his former supervisor. This pushed Mike even further into a depression and only caused his bitterness to grow. On the 31st of October in 1984, Charles took Deanna, Charles, and Doreen's daughter trick-or-treating so Doreen, now over eight months pregnant, could stay home and rest. He said he saved a few houses so Doreen could take Deanna trick-or-treating and see her trick-or-treat as it was her first year really being old enough to truly enjoy it as she was now four years old. Charles was going to stay home and hand out candy to the neighborhood trick-or-treaters while Doreen took Deanna to the last few houses. When Doreen and Deanna returned home, Charles ran to the liquor store. He told Doreen and Deanna that he'd only be gone for a few minutes and he suggested that Doreen locked the door while he was gone. Charles returned home and noticed that the door was unlocked. He found it odd as he suggested that Doreen lock the door and she was usually diligent about doing so. Charles walked into the house and saw Doreen lying on the floor in a deep pool of blood. He then saw the fetus lying on the living room floor. He said the first thought was that she'd had a miscarriage but then he noticed Doreen's hand lying on the living room floor and noticed another part of the fetus. He said he tried to stop the blood by holding her arm very tightly, but he saw severe cuts on her neck and stomach as well. Charles tried to rush to the phone to call 911, but he slipped and fell in the blood, and he was unable to get through to 911, so he called fire rescue. He then noticed Deanna hiding behind the couch in the living room, he took her into the kitchen so she wouldn't see any more than she already had. According to Charles, Deanna told him she heard the baby cry. The paramedics arrived on scene and Charles tried to assist them with Doreen. 
One of the paramedics stated that when they arrived, Doreen still had a pulse. One of the neighbors came out, and Charles took Deanna to sit in the neighbor's car with the neighbor. He looked back and saw the paramedics loading Doreen into the ambulance. He tried to go with Doreen, but the police arrested him after noticing he was covered in blood and he smelled of alcohol. They left him handcuffed in the patrol car for the next hour, and he was enraged, so he started kicking the door in the window. Former San Jose police officer Jamie Salvador said in an interview from the show Snapped, around 9.30 p.m. a call came in of a possible stabbing. He said Charles was hysterical on the call. He told him his wife Doreen was lying on the floor in a deep pool of blood. He said there had to be at least an inch of blood all over the place. One of Doreen's arms was cut at an angle at the forearm, completely cut off. She had many stab wounds in the abdomen and over 25 hits to her head. Doreen was rushed to the hospital, but instead of being allowed to join his wife, Charles was detained for questioning. Investigators said that he was acting erratically and barely making sense. They said he would be the obvious first suspect because he was covered in blood. The officers returned to the inside of the house to search and conduct their investigation. They said the lights were all off, but there was a carved pumpkin sitting on a bar stool with a lit candle in it. They said due to the blood splatter and the nicks on the ceiling, they believed the weapon used would have been a machete. From the blood trail, they believed Doreen was attacked right inside the door as if she had answered a knock on the door and was just attacked as soon as she opened it. Then they discovered a wolf mask. It was immediately tagged as evidence as it was out of place, so they figured it could have been left by the attacker. While the investigators were still at the scene and Charles was detained at the station waiting for questioning, they were notified that Doreen had passed away. A uh, former San Jose police detective, Bert Cairo, said in an interview that, that with the amount of rage in this attack, they believed it to be personal, but he was not convinced that it was they had the right guy in custody. Yet Charles wasn't able to be with his wife as she passed away. Charles said at the station his clothes were all taken from him and he was given a paper gown to wear. He said that an officer came in the room and told him his wife was gone. He asked the officer to hug him, but the officer said he could not do that. Charles continued to deny any involvement in, in the attack on his wife. He explained that he found her when he returned from the liquor store. Charles told the officers that he couldn't think of anyone who would want to hurt Doreen. After spending most of the night interrogating Charles while the investigators continued to search the crime scene for any clues of what could have happened to Doreen, Outside of the house, a blood trail was found leading away from the home. They knew that the blood either belonged to Doreen or it belonged to the assailant who could have possibly been injured during the attack. They then went through the neighborhood speaking with the Herbert's neighbors. One neighbor, Don Isbell, told them that around 6.30 or 7, he took his kids to the Herbert's house to trick-or-treat and Doreen answered the door and it was very obvious that she was pregnant. And then he saw someone standing across the street from the Herbert residence staring at the home and he was wearing a wolf mask. It was Halloween, but the person appeared to be grown and wasn't with any children or moving around, just staring. Another neighbor, Manuel Gonzalez, said he saw a man standing across the street from the Herberts wearing a wolf mask and staring at the house. Another adult was out escorting children to trick-or-treat, and she saw a man wearing a mechanic's type of overalls and a goofy wolf mask at around 8.55 p.m. The man was walking down the street, which Mike lived on, and headed towards the pedestrian overpass that connected Mike's neighborhood to Doreen's. She said the man held a very large grocery bag at his side that appeared to have a heavy object inside of it. Another witness, Mike's 10-year-old at the time, neighbor, told the police that um, he saw a man walking towards the pedestrian overpass at around 8.30 or 9. Other neighbors said that Charles and Doreen were good people with no reason for anyone to hurt them, but pointed out Doreen did have a strained relationship with her ex-husband, William Michael Dennis.
The officers decided that they needed to talk to Mike. Bert Cairo said that when he arrived at Mike's, he shined his flashlight in the window of Mike's truck, which was sitting in the driveway, and he saw blood on the steering wheel, the seat belt, the radio switch, and on the key inside of the truck. They felt the hood, and it was warm. Not hot, but it was warm. When they knocked, no one answered the door, so they decided to look around the house. As they walked around the side of the house, they saw a light on and heard water running. They went back to the front door and heard the water go off, and they knocked again. This time, Mike answered. They said when he came to the door, he was only wearing a robe, and his hands were in his pockets. Former Detective Cairo said that he told Mike that they were investigating the death of Doreen, Mike's former wife. He said Mike just basically responded, hmm, really? Cairo said he found it odd as most people are shocked at the sound of homicide. He said he asked Mike if he would consent to his home being searched and Mike told him sure. When he went to sign for consent, he pulled his hand out of the pocket and it was wrapped in cloth, but... It was bleeding all the way through. Cairo said he asked Mike what had happened, and Mike said that he was twirling a knife in the air, and when he caught it, he missed the handle and grabbed it by the blade. And a side note, Dr. John Nelligan treated Mike for these cuts. He said the cuts would be very painful as they were deep. They were severing nerves, tendons, and the volar plate. They were sharp slicing wounds that required a sharp blade and a fair amount of force to cut through the tendons. These injuries can occur if while a person is grasping a bladed weapon, his forward stabbing thrust is stopped and his hand slides forward onto the blade's edge. During the search, the officers found bloody clothes on the bedroom floor and a revolver behind the headboard of the bed. There were blood drops on the kitchen floor a trail of blood drops that seemed to start about a hundred yards west of Mike's house and proceeded down the driveway was also found. It appeared to continue alongside the garage and they ended in front of the washer and the dryer. They also found a small ball of blood-stained fibers adhering to, to the empty garbage can next to Mike's garage. The same fibers were found in the area that his mother lived in. Bloody gauze was found in the bathroom. The detective said they believed that the blood at Mike's property was too much to have came from him cutting his hand. At this time, Mike was arrested by Sergeant James Morin. Michael's mother was found in a separate apartment at the rear of the house, asleep. At this time, Charles was released. Mike was now questioned at the station. He denied any involvement and said that he had an alibi. He said that he was home since 4 p.m. He said he had dinner with his mother and then he stayed home to pass out candy. During the trial, however, um, his mother testified that they had dinner around 6 or 6.30 and she returned back to her part of the house, a separate apartment at 8.15. His neighbor, however, said that around 6.30 he gave her some mail that had been misdelivered and he told her he was going to a Halloween party. The police did not believe Mike, and they felt that he had plenty of time that no one could vouch for him in which he could have went to the Herbert's home, attacked Doreen, and been gone before Charles returned. Without solid evidence in the state of California in 1984, the police could only hold Mike for 48 hours, so the clock was ticking on them getting to the house and doing a thorough search and look for solid evidence. In Mike's home, they found a receipt from a hardware store for a machete and a label that came off of a machete with an 18-inch blade. However, there was no machete found, so they went to Milpitas Builders Emporium, the hardware store listed on the receipt, and purchased a machete that matched the label and entered it into evidence. They then went into the garage. In the garage, they located two hand-built coffins. Next to these coffins, they found weights, body bags, and a map of the San Francisco Bay. Unfortunately, as chilling as all the items were that were found in Mike's home and garage, it didn't tie him to Doreen's attack, so at the 48-hour mark, they had to release Mike from jail. 
As he left the jail, there was a crowd of reporters waiting to interview Mike, and all he said was he didn't do it. The neighborhood and Doreen's family were scared that Mike would escape justice, and the investigators were desperate for clues at this time. They turned to Deanna, who was the only witness to the crime, but she was only four years old at the time. Detective Caro said that Deanna was traumatized, but with the help of a child psychologist, she was able to tell them what she had witnessed. She said she was sitting on the couch with her mother when she heard a loud bang on the door. She said Doreen went and opened the door, and as soon as she opened it, she was attacked. She said her mother was yelling, get out, get out, and yelled for Deanna to go hide, so she got behind the couch. She said she never got a good look at his face without the mask, but he was walking through the house calling out Deanna's name, so he knew her. He left without finding Deanna, thank God. In an interview on Snap, Deanna said that God kept her safe. And when I saw that, I thought of that song that um, I think it's John Michael Montgomery sang um, in the 90s, The Little Girl. But it just reminded me of that. But the state crime scene concluded testing on the blood found at the crime scene, and it matched Mike's blood type. This was, though, before, like, advanced DNA testing. On the 5th of November, Mike was once again arrested and charged with the unaliving of Doreen. During the investigation, Detective Cairo said an address book belonging to Mike was found. He called the numbers in the address book and he got a hold of a female. She told Cairo that the year prior she had accompanied Mike to a Halloween party and he wore a wolf mask and she did have a photo. On the 19th of July in 1988, Michael would finally stand trial. He was facing first degree unaliving for Doreen and second degree unaliving for her unborn child. Okay guys, this is about to get graphic as I go over the testimony of the autopsy, so please keep that in mind. It is a lot, and I mean a lot. So if you feel that you would be disturbed or triggered by the gruesomeness of it, just please skip over this part. The autopsy had been completed by Dr. John Hauser, and he testified to the results. He said he performed the autopsy on the 1st of November on both Doreen and her unborn son. He said Doreen died from multiple chopping wounds that resulted in her blood draining. The wounds would have probably been inflicted with a heavy, sharp, sword-like instrument that was able to cut cleanly through soft tissues and into bone. The machete Mike purchased could have caused these wounds. Doreen also suffered many cuts on the left and right sides and the back of her head. Some of the cuts penetrated the skull. She had numerous deep wounds on the right side of her head, some of which had fractured her skull and one penetrated inches into her brain. Her left hand was completely severed just above the wrist. She had wounds on the upper back portion of her left shoulder, including a gaping cut down to the bone. She also received several cuts to the right shoulder. Her breast received three cuts, including one that was consistent with a stabbing injury. Her thighs and legs suffered long, deep, gaping wounds consistent with chopping. A heavy blow caused a large gaping cut to her right thigh and penetrated to the bone, fracturing her femur. She had a 9-inch gaping wound in her abdomen and another 5.5-inch chopping wound parallel to that one. She suffered multiple cuts through the abdomen while the fetus was still inside of her. Her stomach and large bowel were cut open. There were three cuts to the uterus wall, including an 8-inch cut that extended through it. Her placenta was cut, and, and there were four cuts to the umbilical cord, including one that severed it near the place where it had been attached to the fetus. The fetus was separated from Doreen after her abdominal wounds. The fetus was one month short of full term and could have survived if it had been born prematurely. A cut to his head penetrated into the bone. His left shoulder blade was cut through, although his arm was not, indicating that it was up and out of the way. His scrotum, penis, and the back of his right thigh were also cut. 
His left leg was severed below the knee. A large five-inch wound cut through half of his body. The wound extended from his upper right abdomen through his left chest to his left armpit, cutting through the left shoulder blade, the liver, the lung, and transecting the heart. This wound would have stopped his heart and circulation. Examination of the lungs demonstrated they had never been expanded and there was no air in them. The fetus never breathed or lived independently of Doreen. The prosecution explained that Michael couldn't get over losing his son and losing the lawsuit made him feel like his son's life meant nothing. They believed due to the evidence found in the garage that he planned to kidnap Charles, Doreen, and Deanna, put them in coffins, and drown them in the San Francisco Bay. This was evidence of premeditation. They believed before he could carry out his plan, something snapped even further in him and he remembered his wolf mask and concocted this plan of revenge. They believed that seeing the children trick-or-treating and realizing Paul couldn't could have been what pushed him over the edge on this particular night. The defense team didn't try to deny that Michael committed the crime. Instead, they argued that he should not be held accountable because he was mentally unstable. The defense also tried to claim that Mike had no idea that Doreen was pregnant. He pled not guilty by reason of insanity. He was examined by psychiatrist Samuel Benson five times during April and May of 1986. The last interview was videotaped and was four hours long. Mike was heavily sedated with a drug that reduces your inhibitions and can help people discuss matters that they have repressed. Dr. Benson recounted a great deal of information he received from and about Mike. He noted Mike suffered from hearing loss as a youth, which caused him to stutter and to stare at other people to read their lips. His parents divorced when he was nine years old. He developed an eating disorder and he gained a lot of weight, and this carried on throughout his life. By the age of 19 or 20, he was depressed and he was unable to get a girlfriend. At one point, he attempted to unalive himself. He told Dr. Benson that he and Doreen married within a year of meeting. He said that they had problems as he lost his job and Doreen had affairs. Now, this is only what Mike said and is not confirmed. He said they divorced after the birth of Paul and that he didn't contest the custody as he believed Doreen was a good mother. He said Doreen's dog drowned in the pool and he became worried about Paul's safety and demanded that the pool be fenced and even offered to pay for part or all of it. A fence was installed. He told Dr. Benson he was then concerned about Doreen using marijuana around Paul. He said he had a close relationship with his son Paul and that Paul often didn't want to be returned to his mother, which was the case the day that he drowned. He initially blamed himself for returning Paul that day. He further told Dr. Benson that he felt Doreen should have jumped into the pool herself to save Paul instead of going to the neighbor's house when she found him. He said he felt like he was the only person that was even sad at Paul's funeral. He said he believed Doreen wanted Paul to be unalived, but no one believed him. Dr. Benson testified that he believed Mike sued Doreen and Charles to to deal with his own guilt. He said that Mike became more psychotic after losing the suit and he held a delusional belief that his attorney was trying to take his life. He believed the therapy Mike received after losing his son was inadequate. Dr. Benson believed that Mike became overwhelmed by longing for his son and was triggered by the trick-or-treating of the children. This is why he believed Mike did this on Halloween night and thought he could get away with it. He said he believed that Mike was suffering from mental illness and had become delusional. He said Mike admitted to him that he took the lives of Doreen and her unborn son, but he insisted he never knew she was pregnant. He said that Mike told him he saw no color during the events that night. He said when Doreen opened the door, she turned away from him and he said, you killed my boy. She recognized his voice and told him to leave. He told her that he was going to take her life and just began stabbing. Mike told Dr. Benson he realized she was pregnant only after he saw the amniotic fluid and the fetus on the floor. He said had he known, he would have never hurt Doreen. 
He said that he left after seeing Doreen vomiting on blood and denied ever cutting the fetus. He said that he asked Doreen while he was stabbing her how it felt to drown. He further told Dr. Benson of his plan to drown Doreen and Charles by placing them into the body bags and in the boxes and loading them into his boat and dumping him into the sea. Dr. Benson felt this too was fantasy. However, he did own a boat and in his garage, the investigators had found two reinforced lockable boxes that he had made and two hand-stitched body bags along with anchors. On the 16th of August in 1988, Michael changed his plea to guilty on both counts. He was sentenced to the unalive penalty they said he never showed any signs of remorse. William Michael Dennis remains in the California Medical Facility as a condemned man. He is now 73 years old. The years following the tragic ending of Doreen's life were hard on Charles, understandably, and he said that he thought of ending it all, but he knew he had to keep going for Deanna. They appear to have a wonderful relationship, which is awesome, as I can't imagine the strength either of them had to have had to overcome the trauma of what happened that night. If you, either one of you ever see this, my heart truly goes out to you. And this brings us to the end of the tragic story of Doreen Herbert and her unborn son. And rest easy, both of you, because you are both free. If you got anything out of this video, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. And until the next video, toodles. I'm equal parts, sacred and profound.